Hi there, welcome to Ask the Chiropractor, your source for ultimate health and healing. I'm Dr. Adam Rodnick, a chiropractor out of Commerce Township, and we're here with our guest today. We have Terry Browning. She's Hello. a clinical therapist. Hi there. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the profession. I know you, you had done a few different avenues within your profession before you found what you're doing now and what you really right. love. Right. Uh, my company name is Alternative Therapies. And I was located in Milford for about 11 years. Uh, before I opened my own practice, Alternative Therapies, I worked in the school system and I was identifying children with attention deficit issues, emotionally impaired problems. And while in that scope of practice in the schools, I noticed that there were a lot of kids being medicated and uh, put on medications for like behavioral problems instead of you know real diagnosis so i opened up my private practice and i started looking for different avenues to serve that population and families in general um, just coming up with different ideas uh, using cognitive therapies and changing habits and learning how to behave in different ways oh, i love how it started through finding a problem finding a need for a fix and then changing your practice to to help with that. Right. And would you say in the schools, have you seen more within the last 10 years, more and more children that are taking SSRIs or antidepressants uh, or methylphenidates, you know, the Ritalin type of medication than ever before? I think that there's a lot more knowledge about the medications now, um, what they can do for, for children. Um, I think that the public is more aware of them and are asking more for them. So yeah, there's an increase and the medications, but I also think that people are a little smarter about how they're using them. Sure, sure. And would you say, you know, a lot of times with the diagnosis, with any kind of treatment, whether it's medication or otherwise, therapy should go hand in hand and they should exactly. always try to get to the root of the problem rather than just, you That's know, right. masking necessarily. Right. I've, I've always been very passionate about mind and body wellness. I think that there's such a connection. Um, I say this so often in my practice now that there really isn't such a thing as a magic pill and a pill that's going to fix everything. It's really a combination. With anything, and we're the same way with, with physical condition, with, with painkillers and things like that. Now, is there a time and a place for them? Absolutely. Do right. I refer out for pain management? Do I refer out for other specialist consults every single day? However, there's no magic pill that's going to fix the problem. We always want to try to get to the root cause and work on that along with you know pain management, things like that. That's right, I, I totally agree. Uh, where I'm working now, uh, I had a practice in Milford, like I said, and now I'm at Lakes Medical Center and I'm in Lakes Psychiatric Center. So we have about 10 therapists and a psychiatrist. This is my first setting ever working so closely with a, a psychiatrist and we just are seeing success so Every day. A much more roundabout approach where right. the psychiatrist can see them and can prescribe any necessary medication while you're also doing therapy instead of just one or just the other. They have access to both under the same roof, huh? It's, it's just all, yeah, it's the whole package and it's all under one roof. And, you know, she actually knows her clients really well. I know her, the, the client, really well. We share information. Um, I think that makes a big difference. And I do see that there is sometimes a need for medication. And when there's a chemical imbalance in the brain, when you're talking about bipolar and you know deep depression and uh, schizophrenia, there's a need for medications for that. But you also have to have the cognitive therapy, the new habits, you know, changing learned behaviors. Still need it, still helps. It's not like it's just the one magic pill and it's done, right? Right, right. So tell us a little bit about <clears throat> mindfulness. Let's talk about you know, some of the stuff you, you actually do with your clients, with your patients, and, and what it means. Uh, when people come into my office, <clears throat> and I really am talking about everybody, not just a certain age group, not just a certain you know, um, race, everybody. Uh, sharing the mindfulness set is helpful to anybody. And it can be a life changer. Because what we're talking about is changing the way you think about something, you know, flipping that thought around, uh, being more positive uh, thinking. If you think about the world we live in, it, it moves so fast. And oftentimes we're rushing to keep up with it and we're preparing for what's next. 
And a lot of times that involves negative thinking and um, stress becomes just a normal part of the day. And would you say, you know, two people could have the exact same experience, the exact same incident, and yet one of them would manifest it much worse mentally and physically than, than another one by the way they react to that said event. That's right. And if you think about where does somebody come from, <clears throat> how they've learned to deal with stress, uh, has a lot to do w with that outcome. You know, how bad is it? Does this turn into a crisis? Am I ab able to cope with it and go into the next step of problem solving? You know, that's where it really changes. So when somebody comes in my office, I always like to share that skill set because that's really what it is. It's a skill set. And uh, how do you change a negative thought? I mean, first of all, you have to be aware that the negative thought is even happening. So if you'd like, I can share with you how that cycle looks. Absolutely. Okay. So if you think about negative thinking, it's kind of like a cycle that goes round and round, <laughs> right? And it starts with one negative thought. That one negative thought will lead to a kind of internal or external physical reaction. Sometimes it's a tightening of your jaw, Sometimes it's a tightening in your shoulders or your neck. In any case, everybody's a little different, but when you have that reaction, it kind of sends a signal to your brain, uh-oh, and I need to start to worry. So we have that one negative thought that leads to that physical reaction that leads to that uh-oh, which I call anxiety, because anxiety is really, if I can write here, <clears throat> anxiety is really just a, a worry kind of thought. So that one negative thought leads to this, what leads to more negative thinking, which is like, uh-oh, what if this happens? Then this is gonna happen, which is more negative thinking, and we just get stuck in this cycle, right? Sure. This is the point where, where I often see in patients. This is where they're physically manifesting. Right. And so someone has negative thoughts or someone's under a lot of stress, you know, what we see physically a lot of times, like you said, they tighten their jaw, which tightens right. up the muscles of the neck, goes to the back of the skull, the occiput. They could have more headaches. A lot of times they'll roll the shoulders forward, a more stressed posture. Usually they'll, they'll do this. And what I always see is that patients will say to me, Doc, I hold all my stress right here. Well, it's not like, you know, this person holds their stress on their shoulders, but this one holds them in their hand and this one on their foot. We place stress where we biomechanically place it. So for instance, let's say I was holding a bag, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm holding a bag, let's say, down at my side here, right? Let's say it's just held down at my side. Right. I'm putting the pressure and the tension on my joints. I could hold a bag here like this, or wait, for hours. And I'll be fine just holding it like this because I got shoulder joint, elbow joint, wrist joint holding it. But if, for instance, I decided to hold the bag like this, within an hour, or less, my arm would be shaking, my muscles would be, my bicep would be throbbing, I, I would, would not be able to hold the bag that much longer, right? Right. And so the same thing happens here. When we're, what we see is the manifestation of the stress brings the head forward. When the head goes forward, we're now not using the normal structure of the cervical spine to weight bear the weight of the head and hold the joint like we do with our bag, and now you're constantly using these muscles. So we see a lot of times neck pain, Sometimes right. even numbness, tingling in the hands, right. headaches a lot of times too. And so it starts oftentimes not with a physical injury like a right. sports injury or a car accident. It starts a lot of times with thoughts, the way they react Stress. to things in their life. Mm -hmm. So with mindfulness, <laughs> when we're doing this cycle, we can always only do this for so long before it leads straight up to stress. And I always ask people, because now I'm talking about what's the emotional side of stress? What does that look like? It looks like anger. Um, it looks like being weepy, teary. Uh, it looks like isolating. Uh, Is he more tired as well? If fatigue, exha exhaustion, yes. Um, I mean, when you think about stress, and I use this example a lot, when you go to the grocery store, can you tell when someone's stressed out? A total stranger just walking past you in the grocery store. Most of the time when we see someone who is really stressed out, you can see it on their face, you can see it in how they hold their body, like you said earlier. It's very apparent. Hands clenched, shoulders rolled. Hands clenched, rolled. good example, yes. 
So uh, this is what I'm telling clients is when you lead, when, when this cycle of negative thinking leads you into being stressed out, you can only stay there for so long before you have what I like to call a relapse. And a relapse is really just, if you have a lot of anxiety, it's a panic attack. People who have anxiety know what panic attacks look like, right? If it's anger that you show when you're all stressed out, then you have the escalated anger, the blow up, the stomping around, right? Um, a lot of kids, and when I say kids, I'm talking high school, young college kids. Here you're talking about eating disorders and purging. That's where all of that happens, right? In this section in this here. Se okay. In this section. Once because anxiety is built up so much, it yeah, blows, huh? Now we go to relapse. So people who <clears throat> drink would be drinking more here. Um, this is where I like to draw the line. Because when you're mindful and you have awareness of this going on down here, you don't necessarily have to go to the stress and even lead to a relapse. Hopefully, when you're mindful, you're figuring out and you have this increased awareness of your thought pattern and you can stop it here. Go from anxiety back to positive thought rather than negative well, thought. Well, flipping the thought, right? Okay. So <clears throat> I like to feel, I, I always share this with clients is that I feel like we live up here a lot in our world because it goes so fast and we're always so rushed. And so people really don't have any knowledge of this down here. They're all up here all the time, bouncing back and forth, right? So you see a lot of conflict and relationships and things like that going on. When you have that increased awareness of the negative thought and you can catch yourself in the worry, because we all worry, then you can go to your next new coping mechanism, which is being mindful and letting that thought go. Uh, there's lots of other things we can do too, but I'm sure that you talk about this with your clients too, is how do you stop that cycle and not end up stressed yeah, and out? And another, another one we see a lot too is one physical manifestation before, as they're getting to this point is lack of total lung volume, total lung capacity when we're in a stressed posture. So this is an analogy I'll do with patients all the time is have them stick their head as far forward as they can, and you guys can try this at home too, and take a nice deep breath. And then you'll set up nice and straight and take a nice deep breath. You'll see you get a lot more oxygenation. So when you're in this position, you're getting less total lung volume, less total lung capacity. So you're more fatigued, you're more right. tired, you're more irritable automatically. And it, right. it makes it much easier for you to jump to that section just because of the way you feel all sure, the time. Sure, sure. And irritable is such a good <clears throat> example of that. And if too. you're irritable, it's faster to jump up there, would you sure. say? Sure, right, yeah. right. It, they just kind of go hand in hand, don't they? And so one thing we try to do, you know, Obviously, we will try to educate our patients as much as we can, but we try to help stop this physically and help give them physical instructions to have better breathing, better posture, in order to make them automatically less irritable, feeling better to help, you know, and we right. can work really well together where you can help them deal with this part, you know, the anxiety, that right. the feelings, but physically, if we can help them to feel better, breathe better, move better, a lot of times it can help them to well, even, even cope stress. better. Yeah, exactly. When they're feeling better, they can cope better. Right, exactly. Right? When you're having all that chronic pain, you kind of get lost in the chronic pain, and then you can't even do this part. Right, you right. You know, because you're lost you in that in chronic that pain. Yeah. Right. So kind of the next step uh, when I'm talking with clients is when you catch yourself in anxiety, when you catch yourself in that negative kind of worry thought, um, you catch yourself in that kind of what ifing, what's next, preparing for what's next, a lot of times when we're preparing for what's next, that next thing never even happens. So I kind of use the analogy of like a car and burning its tires. Mm -hmm. You're expending all this energy on what's next and figuring out what's coming up next and then that next never even happens, which is another good reason to catch yourself during that thought pattern and stop it. Uh, but a lot of people will say, well, that's really easy to say, but how easy is it to do? Right. Everyone likes to what if. And the old, the old right. acronym for fear, there was a false evidence appearing real. You're afraid of something's going to happen that possibly or probably won't even happen, but there's lots of those that's thoughts right. out there all the time. Right. That's, so, that's good, yep. So what are some techniques, you know, or some, some methods, you know, you could suggest that, that you guys do suggest that, uh, you know, people do to help combat that or think about it or catch it in the act. Right. Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple little cheats, right? So when you catch yourself in that worry thought, uh, oftentimes you can 
think to yourself, okay, I don't really need to be worried about this right now. I'm gonna let this go. But what happens is it just comes right back, right? So learning to be mindful is being in this moment that we're at right now. And so one of the cheats is like just stopping and doing a factual observation. I'm sitting here with Dr. Rodnick and I have a marker in my hand and my feet are on the floor and it's warm in here. Now I'm back in my moment. Now I'm not thinking ahead, right? Sure. So yeah. with, with some of the things that you teach your patients, it could be, you know, my feet are on the floor, but I'm sitting up straight, you know, and my neck is in the right place. Do some posture take exercises. take a deep breath, yeah. right? Yeah. And kind of relax. Exercises, roll their shoulders back. Right, Things like right. that as well. So kind of being in your moment is the key to being mindful. Um, stopping the thoughts that are coming and kind of interrupting your day is, 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 is a skill and it's difficult to do. So we have that factual observation. We also have what I call my three threes and it's named three things that I can see, three things that I can hear, and three things I can touch. And it takes about a second to do. You can do it anywhere. And when you stop to use your senses, like if I stop to listen, try that at home. Just stop and listen to what's around you right this second. When you hyper-focus that way, your mind shuts off, it goes blank, and it's quiet. Take you back to planet Earth right away, huh? That's right. And I mean, being quiet, having your mind be That's quiet like is really difficult. It's a challenge. And focusing on the senses certainly distracts you from the thoughts. Huh? That's right. And it keeps you... It, it actually gives you a really small window of opportunity to pick what you want to think about next. And I do call that my window of opportunity because you have a couple seconds to decide what you want to think about. So I'll give you an example of that because most people don't really get that we're actually controlling what we think. Um, when I go to the gym, I pass the DQ Dairy Queen. It's like right next to the gym. And I'm driving to the it, right? gym. Yeah. <laughs> I'm driving to the gym and I'm thinking, ooh, I really want to stop there, <laughs> you know? So I don't stop there and I keep driving. And as soon as I pass the Dairy Queen, that thought is gone. So I picked up the thought and I thought it, but I also let it go. And you can do that with all your thoughts, but it's not something that you consciously are aware of unless you're practicing mindfulness skill set, right? Absolutely. I love that with the focusing on the senses because it immediately takes you right back to the present rather than all the what ifs and, and hows that could happen. Now, would you say there's certain things people can do like, like hobbies or exercising are really also good ways and methods to distract themselves from the anxiety, from negative feelings? Yeah, I think that um, I, I do agree that having an outlet, you know, a lot of people have outlets because they can hyper focus on what they're doing and their mind is shut Zone off from all from their the problems. Day. Sure, right? I mean, I like to play sports, so I play racquetball and tennis and things, and it's nice. At the end of a day, I have a long day, I'm very busy, I, right. I go play sports and it just lets me drop it all. And yes, it's really focus great. On that or watch a baseball game. Or, you know. Right, if you, can, if you can get into something that way and you really have <laughs> some passion about it, it's such a wonderful coping mechanism. Um, one of the other things uh, for the cycle and stopping it and having that window of opportunity and using that to your best advantage, um, we've been having an, a lot of studies done, uh, neurobiologists have been doing a lot of studies on mindfulness and how does that relate to our you know, physical self. And doing your grateful list, you know, at that moment when you have shut off your thoughts and you wanna to move to the next step, Doing your grateful list actually will, you know, um, create some serotonin and dopamine and make you feel better. And so even though a lot of us get hit with things in our lives that are, you know, very serious and, you know, maybe a, a crisis of some sort, even during those moments, if you can even try to do a grateful list, it will still release that dopamine and that serotonin and make you feel just a little bit better until you can move on to your next step. So what's the best way to do a, would you say a grateful list is just you're listing, you're naming things you're grateful for in life, right? right. Grateful, grateful for my family, grateful for my job, grateful for right. my pets, whatever else. Exactly. And, it, it, it and just can, think about those things and try to feel it while you're thinking or? And it can just be, I'm grateful for sitting outside right now and having the sun on my face. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm grateful to be watching the snow 
as it drops, right? It could sure. be it could be anything, really. Anything. Because right. we all usually have at least one thing that we can be grateful for. Sure. But it's hard to remember that when you're going through some type of crisis or you're going through a difficult situation and you know, it's affecting you physically, it's affecting you mentally. We have to just go back to our coping mechanisms and remember to use those. And how often would you say someone should, should run through a grateful list or and how many things should they hit when they do it? I feel like you should just do it whenever you can. Whenever you can, okay. I, I just think that whenever you can stop and do that, it's gonna put a positive spin on your day. Sure. And you're and gonna feel better. Hit three, four, five things when you do it or just think of one or two things or it doesn't matter. I, I don't think it really matters, and I really, I guess it's it's probably up to you. You know what you want to do and what you're really grateful for. Big ones or small ones doesn't matter, right? Right. I'm grateful that the Tigers could have a chance of making the playoffs. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Yes, it's um, you know, it's a really good way to get back into a positive place, and then, like you said, you know, if you have something that you're passionate about, a hobby or something. You can move on to doing that, you know, whether it's I'm going to go for a run, or I'm going to paint a picture, you know, I'm going to go see my chiropractor and feel better. Absolutely. <laughs> that could be a good hobby for everybody, right? <laughs> it's a great one. Right. So let's talk a little bit too about the actual body chemistry and some of the physiology. So you mentioned you can change your dopamine and your serotonin levels by, by thoughts and by thinking. And, and I just want to reiterate that to people that most people don't think that body chemistry, actually what's going on in your body can change by just the way that you think and you feel. Right. And, and would you say the, the opposite, if you have negative thoughts, negative feelings, and worry all the time, it's going to negatively affect your body chemistry? Well, think about that. I mean, there's so many studies out about that as well. I mean, when you're thinking negative thoughts, when you're feeling a lot of stress, your cortisol levels go up. It's a proven fact that that happens. Your immune system goes down. So and your people that are sick down. and tired of being sick and tired, a lot of them are always in this stress mentality. And right. so they're they're not able to fight off infection as easily they, they right. seem to someone sneezes in cleveland they get a cold here you know right <laughs> compared to other people who are in a bus filled with people sneezing all over them and, and they don't but because they their immune system is, is a little stronger and it's more active and more attentive as well right yes and so uh we have a couple things we describe with the nervous system sympathetic response and parasympathetic response and so i'll kind of explain those a little bit a sympathetic response that we call fight or flight Right. right, and that's let's say if somebody is getting chased by a tiger, or somebody is about to mug you. Immediately, your nervous system changes, your body chemistry changes, your pupils dilate, your blood pressure increases, your heart rate increases, uh, cortisol levels change, insulin levels change, blood is pumped away from your digestive system and reproductive system is pumped to your muscles so that you could fight harder, jump higher, run faster. And so, would you say that when people are under a lot of stress? their body stays in that position a little longer, which is negative for their overall health. Right, and like we talked earlier, when you're in this stress place, you could be there for a week. You could be there for three mm -hmm. days. It really depends on you. What does your system look like? You know, have you been here before? Do you live here all the time? Because then the relapse happens a whole lot quicker and it lasts a lot longer. So you're talking about panic attacks are is definitely the fight or flight. Um, it's very real. A lot of people end up in the emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack, and that is all because of stress, which is all about negative thinking. So, and definitely. would you say um, the the balance between work life, home life, and going back and forth can can help people or hurt them in the same regard? You know, if they're really stressed at work, and then going to home really helps them reset, or vice versa, they're really stressed at home, and then they can bury themselves in work to help alleviate that. Would you say having a healthy balance right. can help? Yes, I think balance is so important in life. And I think it also is a, is a challenge in the world that we live in, having a balanced life, because we all are, are moving so fast, we have a lot to do in one day, and it, it becomes a little overwhelming. Um, again, we kind of go back to, all right, what am I thinking about? Do I have awareness that I'm having all of this negative thinking about my day coming up or even on the way home and processing the day are you thinking about it in a negative way or are you thinking about it in a positive way and what would you say is a good you know sim symptom to look for or starting point when someone should seek help and and talk to a therapist would you say people should do it proactively you know prophylactically or just 
if they get to a certain point? When would you see the time to say, you know, we want to call Terry Browning and I want to make an appointment today? What would they look for for that? You know, it's funny because sometimes I have people come in every six months for a checkup. And I think that's a great idea. Uh, but it really is about quality of life. You know, I, if, you're, if you're not happy, if you don't feel like you're at your balanced place, if you don't feel like your quality of your life is as good as it could be, sometimes all you need is a little checkup. And sure. it could be, you know, three sessions and you're feeling a whole lot better. I have clients who I have gone through mindfulness stuff with, spent maybe two or three sessions with them, and their life is totally changed. And how long is a typical session? 45 minutes. 45 minutes, okay. And how often, you know, when someone is under, when someone's really bad and they need a lot of sessions, how often would they usually have one? Would it be monthly, weekly, daily? It's so different. Depending on the patient? Yeah, it's so different. I mean, um, I worked in the hospitals uh, for a while and doing psych unit and outpatient, uh, intensive outpatient therapy, which is every single day. You know, every day from nine in the morning till three Multiple in the hours, afternoon, right, right. right? And then I have clients, like I said, that I see once every six months, once every two years. Sure, and so, we have the same thing in our office. We have people that come in for adjustments very regularly because they just had a major injury from a sports injury or right. a car accident or falling off of a roof or something. And then we have people that just come in a couple times a year for tune-ups, just the same, the same way as well. Right. So anything else that people could maybe look for just in general, if they feel like they're not happy or they're not as content as they could be, be proactive. Talk well, to somebody. Yeah, I Go mean, after it, if, you're, if you feel like you have a lot of conflict in your life, if you feel like you're struggling and it's a consistent pattern, I'm all about patterns, so I'm a therapist, uh, but we're always looking for patterns. And so if your pattern has a bit of a negative spin to it and you find like you're having problems in a lot of different relationships, not just one, or you're having problems at work and at home, you know, there's probably the something pattern, going huh? on. Sure. And it's a good, yeah, it's a good idea to have a little checkup and see what's happening. And Well, thank you so much for joining us. Again, well, thank we're here you. with that was Terry Browning, very fun. clinical thank therapist. You. And this has been Ask the Chiropractor, your source for ultimate health and healing. I'm Dr. Adam Rodnick out of Commerce Township, Michigan. I'm a chiropractor, and we'll see you next time. Stay healthy. Mm -hmm.